I'm Phil Sloan. I'm one of the co-organizers of the uh, workshop up here from uh, outside of this, this community, and we're very pleased to welcome you to the fourth in this series of uh, uh, lectures that have been taking place this week. Our, our final lecture will be tomorrow at the same time with uh, Professor Gil Mylander from Valparaiso University, who's going to be uh, talking on the question of biotechnology and human dignity. Uh, we've been doing this uh, through the week, uh, as you obviously probably know, uh, this uh, session on stem cells and alternative methods, but it's really been running much even larger than that in terms of, of dealing with the questions of biotechnology and uh, modern science and some of the challenges that's bringing, and particularly in this, this area of developmental biology that is, uh, we think, uh, several of us think it's going to be one of the most uh, uh, important uh, issues. And so it's my great pleasure to, to introduce my co-organizer, Professor Carter Sneed. I should say that I first uh, came into contact with Carter Sneed when he gave one of the Schmitz lectures that's sponsored by the Center for Ethics and Culture. And here was a person from law school talking about people like Aristotle and Hans Driesch and uh, developmental biology. And I went up to him afterward and I said, how did you learn about such things? Well, why would you know about this? And it turned out that he'd gone to St. John's College, which was a sister program or at least, you know, or, or fellow programs, great books program. He'd also been the lab assistant for four years in the St. John's program. And uh, so that started a, a, a relationship that really has been developing, even leading to this workshop. Uh, he's been a major uh, scholar. He's been on, the he's a legal, was a legal advisor for the Presidential Council on Bioethics under Leon Cass. Uh, he is, uh, I led the U.S. government de delegation to the uh, and worked on the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights. He's a member of the International UNESCO Committee on uh, uh, of the United Nations on uh, bioethics, and he's uh, working extensively in this question of bioethics and the law and public bioethics. It's really quite a new field in the law, and I think this has been very exciting to learn uh, to learn this. So, uh, with no further ado, I'm going to. Give Carter Sneed the floor. I want to make sure. Can it, can everyone hear me? Is this is this this is working? Okay, everybody can hear me. Great, um, <coughs> excellent. Uh, so thus far, we've had uh, engaging presentations on um, throughout this this week on science and and uh, and, and philosophy, ethics, uh, some theology, um, and uh, today we're going to turn to law. And my uh, aspiration for this talk is to give you sort of um, uh, a rich account of the current legal uh, and public policy landscape that touches and concerns uh, embryonic stem cell research. Stem cell research more generally is probably a better way to put it, um, with special attention to the federal level. Uh, in principle, there could, be, uh, there could be 50 different frameworks for regulating uh, embryonic stem cell research. Uh, and, and states do take widely varying approaches, with California taking a broadly permissive approach where there, in fact, is a state constitutional right to engage in <coughs> cloning for biomedical research. At the one end of the spectrum, at the other end of the spectrum, you have Louisiana, which declares in its statutes uh, that an embryo is a juridical person uh, with all the rights and entailments that follow from that legal designation. So it would be an undoable task to try to give you uh, at, this, uh, at, the, at this sort of state level, an account of everything that, that, that goes on in the brief time that we have. So I'm going to focus my attention on the federal level, which makes sense in, in, in a, uh, for, from most perspectives, because it's at the federal level that most of the public discourse and, and action has taken place over the past decade. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's been a dispute over the federal funding of embryonic stem cell research, which has taken up most of the attention in public bioethics generally, it's certainly the most important public bioethics question uh, in, uh, in, 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 in America um, for the past 10 to 12 years. And when I say public bioethics, by the way, uh, what I'm referring to uh, is the governance of science and medicine and the applications of biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. So it's, <coughs> it's not merely ethical reflection, it's not really merely deliberation, but rather infused with the coercive authority of the state, uh, and uh, more on that uh, in a moment. <clears throat> but I, I will say, before, uh, before turning to um, 
to, uh, to some further background information before I proceed, that um, my goal in giving you this account today is not simply to give you a, a narrow description, but rather give what I hope will be a richer account of the public bioethics of stem cell research in America. Uh, and by richer account, I mean one that drills down uh, to, the, to the foundational goods that undergird the laws in this area. They don't simply describe the law to you, but law are mechanisms that are aimed to vindicate certain uh, agreed upon normative goods. And it's understanding those normative goods that I think uh, it leads to the richest understanding of the law itself. Now, to understand the current situation with respect to embryonic stem cell research in the United States, uh, you, ha you have to understand uh, the sort of the, the, the stretch of the past 40 plus years, uh, uh, which has really been a kind of um, a story of conflict between, uh, at first, only the uh, political branches of the federal government, the Congress and the White House, and, until, and very recently, uh, the judicial branch of the federal government has also become involved. Um, but it's, uh, this story is, uh, is a story about, uh, is about politics, um, uh, it's, it's about, uh, about uh, political uh, debate, it's about elections, it's about competing principles, normative principles, shifting majorities in and, and Congress and uh, different occupants of the White House. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, um, it gives you a sense of the complexity of, of, this, of this field generally and all of the different moving parts and all the branches of government that are, that are implicated in that. Now, as I move through my remarks, I want you to sp pay special attention to certain kinds of cross-cutting themes. Uh, first of all, uh, as you can see up here, uh, a cross-cutting theme that I think will lead again to a richer understanding of the subject matter generally is that law itself is a moral enterprise. As I said a moment ago, law is the product of agreed upon uh, of, of, of deliberation and agreement with respect to deep grounding norms. It, it's a, and if you look at the law, you can draw inferences, important inferences, about what a given polity takes seriously, what goods it holds dear, and what harms it seeks to avoid. Uh, so there's a, a kind of reflective, a moral reflective function of the law that is important to take on board and that is relevant to uh, understanding this topic in particular. But the law doesn't simply reflect prevailing morality of a, uh, of a given society. It also shapes and constitutes that, those moral judgments. Um, it, it's a, a kind of pedagogical function of the law that is important to understand, uh, especially for this particular subject. Um, it, 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 again, it doesn't merely reflect the shared commitments of a given society, but it also, it also shapes and constitutes them as well. Um, another theme to, 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 to bear in mind as, as, as you hear the story of the past 40 years on this particular question uh, is, the, is the idea that regulation, and we, we heard some about this in the, early, in the remarks of our earlier speakers, is not simply a binary mechanism. It's not simply prohibition or permission. It's a very fine-grained kind of mechanism, and each sort of point on the regulatory spectrum carries with it, in my judgment, a, a different and distinctive moral message. And, uh, and, and the, uh, in the context of embryonic stem cell research is an, is an, excellent, an excellent domain to, to, to see that this is true. So at the most permissive end of the spectrum of regulation, you have affirmative endorsement, right, where the government itself uh, expressly endorses, commends, and encourages a certain kind of activity. And the perfect example of that is the federal funding of a given enterprise. Federal fun if the government federally funds embryonic stem cell research, that I think sends an important normative message that this activity is a praiseworthy activity. It's, it, it's, it's, it's entitled to allocation of the scarce resources that we have. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it really does signal a kind of, uh, of, uh, of acceptance and, and appreciation for that activity. The other end of the, of, the, of the spectrum of regulation, you have criminal prohibition. A good example in this area that relates to uh, embryonic stem cell research are bans on all forms of cloning. Obviously, nothing speaks uh, as clearly as a criminal ban that the underlying activity is, uh, is itself uh, uh, harmful, wrongful, to be avoided uh, on pain of very serious consequences. And between these two poles of, of uh, the permissive and restrictive poles of, 
of regulation. You have between that, again, a very fine-grained set of possibilities. And these, these are just merely by way of example. Uh, <clears throat> anything ranging from sort of silent permission of a given activity, which is the default rule in our system of government. When the government doesn't restrict something, there's, a, there's the implicit uh, understanding that it's permitted, uh, which I think carries with it a sort of moral message of, uh, of, of tolerance, uh, although um, it can be, can be ambiguous, though. Sometimes silence in the law is a function of gridlock and the failure to be able to arrive at some kind of mutually agreed solution. And so instead of, instead of um, it, so it, it, could be, uh, it could reflect division, intractable division, as well as tolerance. So it's not, entire, it's not always clear what the law is saying with respect to uh, certain kinds of activities. But, but uh, in any event, it's important to understand that there is this, there is this wide array of possibilities in the law. There's a whole degree of, there's a whole array of, 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 of complex moves that the government can make with respect to certain kinds of activities, and each one of which has a, a very special and, and distinct moral significance. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in my talk about the uh, principal normative issue at is uh, that, that, that arises in the context of embryonic stem cell research. It's important to mention it here, uh, uh, but I'm not going to uh, explore all the competing views except insofar as I will be giving a fairly exhaustive account of the justifications of each uh, successive administration and taking different positions on this question. But um, the uh, Obviously, well, to my mind, the, the, the key question here is, what is the moral status of the human organism at the embryonic state of development? And this is a, in, in the deepest sense, a kind of who counts question. Who, is one of, who, who counts as one of us? Who is entitled not only to moral respect, but also to the protection of the law? Uh, not only who counts, but, this, but the closely related question of who, is, who does the counting? Who gets to say who counts? And according to what principles? These are the sort of deepest questions that, uh, that, can, that can arise in, in the context of governance. Because the answer to this question, obviously, um, implicates the, the, the core purpose of government itself. Right? I mean, at least a core purpose of government, and obviously this would be contested by political theorists, but a core purpose of government is to protect citizens from private violence. In fact, some might argue, some have argued, very famously, that that's the whole point of government. When we come together, uh, we have a social contract because we're weak and defenseless and vulnerable when we're by ourselves. So we come to communities to live in communities together. And this, is, this is not obviously the only or the most noble version of why we come together to live. But, uh, but it's, it's certainly, I think, one of uh, important truth about what government is for, which is to protect people from private violence. And if you are not uh, a, uh, within the circle of protection of those laws on the grounds that you don't count as, uh, as a, a rights-bearing individual or a person for whom the government should take consideration, that has serious consequences. So I want, uh, I, I, I raise this uh, at, at the moment, and it's going to come back later, but I, it's important to underscore without getting into the fine-grained details of the debate that, um, that the, more, the embryonic stem cell question at, at bottom is a question about who, who counts. It's a quite, in David Solomon's uh, uh, phrase, I think it's a great phrase, it's a, it's a, quite, it's a problem of membership. Um, and, uh, but interestingly, in our, in our situation in America, it hasn't really been raised, or at least it hasn't been debated, as you'll see in a moment, uh, on those terms. It hasn't, it's, uh, the primary question, the first order question of the moral status of the embryo, the first order moral question, the first order question of the permissiveness of embryo destructive research has not been the public question at the federal level that has been debated. From uh, its, its inception, we'll talk about this in a moment, the question has been about federal funding. The question has been about whether and to what extent the federal government should fund research that requires the use and destruction of living human beings at the embryonic stage of development. Now, if you tell people in other countries that this is the question that we've been debating, they would either assume that you've already settled the question of the moral status of the embryo, or they think it's very strange that you would start with this question as opposed to the first order question of whether we should be doing this at all. Now, there are complicated reasons for why this, uh, why thi why this is where we start in the American experience with this particular question. Uh, this is the, the, the iteration of the question that we've engaged. Uh, 
and you'll see as we move through, but I mean, it's a complicated question relating to the structure of our government, to the nature of the political question as it emerged in our distinctive history, uh, and the nature of, um, of, uh, of, of, of the separation of powers between the executive branch of government, who is, in this case, responsible for allocating the funds that Congress appropriates. Um, so th there are interesting answers to that question, which I think will emerge from my account of the history itself. But it's important to notice that the question that we've been dealing with is this question of funding, not the question of, uh, of permissibility. So connected to that question, obviously, of whether we should fund it, is the sort of normative meaning of federal funding, which I talked about moments ago. The scope and substance of moral complicity, that is of the taxpayer who has to live in a regime that federally subsidizes this kind of activity. Uh, what the government, the posture of the government should be with respect to the conscience of those citizens who have grave reservations about this kind of activity. And then finally, sort of from a different angle of, of approach, the obligations of citizenship. To what extent must one accept the consequences of elections uh, and the deliberative processes of, of the majoritarian branches of government, even if you disagree profoundly with what they're doing? Um, these are all questions that are bound up in the question of federal funding of embryonic stem cell research. Now, those are all cross-cutting themes that you should hold in your mind as you hear this narrative account of, uh, of, 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 of our struggle that culminates with the current policy that President Obama announced uh, on March 9th. It was fleshed out by the NIH uh, a couple months thereafter. This story uh, involves, and we've talked about this, we talked around this throughout the, uh, the past week, <coughs> it really implicates the confluence of, of several different uh, interesting uh, sources of authority, scientific, <coughs> legal, political, and cultural. And it starts in 1968. It starts in 1968. You can see there's Edwards and Steptoe, the recent Nobel laureates who pioneered in vitro fertilization. So for the first, in 1968, they first they achieved fertilization of a human egg outside of the body, in vitro, in glass. And we're able for the first time, as their, as their techniques improved thereafter, to hold outside of the body the human being at the earliest stages of biological development. This is an amazing thing. Obviously, in an obviously sort of causal way, this, is, this was the first moment that gave rise to the possible uh, uh, disputes about, embryo, uh, about embryo research generally. Uh, before this, you obviously couldn't, I mean, you, with the embryo outside the body, there are, there are new possibilities for experimentation, manipulation, and destruction of the human person. Um, uh, but but it, it's also important to note that th th this is a real, this is a real um, important boundary crossing. I mean, before this moment, and in fact, this is implicit in what Ben was talking about with respect to the definition of the fetus in the 1970s, you didn't even know with certainty that the human being was present until implantation occurred. So the first two weeks in, si in vivo, you know, you, you, could, ha you could have a, a you could uh, speculate about the presence of the, of, the, of, the, of the embryo inside the woman's body prior to implantation. But you didn't even know it was there. And now we had it outside the body and we're holding it in our hands, which is an extraordinary, um, extraordinary development in, in, in human history. So alongside the, um, these developments in, in, the, in the areas of in vitro fertilization, there was also uh, the connected, as Ben said, the connected uh, but not identical issue of abortion <coughs> was unfolding uh, in America and, and most specifically in the Supreme Court. And with the decision, Roe versus Wade, in which the court declared that there was a constitutional right to abortion, um, uh, that decision breathed into life a kind of social disruption uh, and the existence of, of social movements, the, the, the pro-life movement and the abortion rights movement, uh, that um, added a different level of uh, moral significance to manipulations involving the human being at the very beginnings of life in the embryo research context. So um, Congress uh, worried about the uh, reports of some grisly um, fetal experimentation uh, instances, uh, uh, mostly abroad. In fact, it was the, 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 the sort of lore is that it was Eunice Shriver uh, who heard about very disturbing uh, accounts of, of fetal experimentation involving 
just grotesque uh, abuse of, uh, of, of unborn children who were slated for abortion uh, to test different kinds of uh, equipment. And she uh, urged her, her relative, Senator Ted Kennedy, to convene hearings to try to explore uh, what might be done and how the government might play a role in the oversight of these kinds of th th this, this kind of research abuse. And it wasn't her judgment research abuse. So you had the fetal tissue, or you had the sort of fetal experimentation piece, and you also had other um, concerns about, um, about different kinds of abuses in the research context that, get, that gave rise to a series of congressional hearings that culminated, and, and, uh, and, uh, and they began, by the way, by imposing a moratorium on federal funding of, of fetal and embryo research while it studied the question. And it created the National Commission uh, for the Protection of Human Subjects and Biomedical Behavioral Research that Ben talked about in his lecture and, there, and, and, and who was charged with issuing a report making recommendations on fetal tissue research to avoid the kinds of abuses that Eunice Schreiber was worried about. Uh, but also, because this was contemporaneous with developments in IVF, also to formulate some kind of, uh, some kind of um, proposal or framework for the regulation uh, or oversight of uh, the federal funding of in vitro fertilization related research, research involving IVF embryos. So in their, in their report, the National Commission recommended that an ethical advisory board, that an ethics advisory board be created whose brief it would be to approve any uh, research proposals for federal funding that involve the use and destruction of IVF embryos. Uh, so the, uh, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which has now been renamed the Department of Health and Human Services, which by law was required to take the recommendations of the National Commission on Bioethics uh, and either build their recommendations into the, into the regulatory framework or show cause why they, they weren't going to do it, uh, followed the suggestion and established uh, in 1975 the Ethics Advisory Board. Uh, uh, by, and they did that by enacting regulations, which had the force of law, that required EAB approval of all research proposals involving IVF embryos. So the EAB was formed in 1975. They convene. They're going to deliberate and talk about um, uh, uh, what the standards should be if they're going to, uh, if, if they're going to approve federally funded IVF research. They issue their, and the, during their deliberations, you've seen the slide earlier today, during their deliberations, uh, Louise Brown was born, the first uh, baby born who was conceived uh, by IVF, and again, adding a, another layer of moral salience to the questions that they were considering. Well, the Ethics Advisory Board recommended federal funding for research involving IVF embryos in 1979, but then their charter expired in 1980, and after their charter expired, uh, the executive branch did not appoint any new members, nor did it renew the appointments of the former members. Now, why is that? Well. President Reagan, who was elected in 1980, and his successor, President Bush, his vice president and then successor, President Bush, didn't approve of federal funding of embryo, of embryo research. And so rather than um, dealing with the issue frontally by uh, supporting legislation uh, to that effect, they simply said, you know what, we, won't, we just won't name any members to this, to this board. There's already a, a legal regulation. There's already an, uh, an HEW reg that requires this board to approve any federal funding for embryo research. And if there's nobody on the board, then no federal funding will ever be authorized. And they were right. And until 1993, there was no federal funding for, uh, for embryo research of any kind because a non-existent board was legally required to approve it. Well, then we had the 1992 presidential election. Uh, and, and, so, and, and by the way, at the first phase, so. It, <laughs> Of, of, of this history, you have uh, a, a Congress who's enthusiastic about, about pursuing embryo research with federal funds, and an executive branch that doesn't, I'm thinking from 1980 until 1993. Then you had in 1992 in the, in the elections uh, the, the, uh, the arrival of a, kind of, um, of a kind of convergence between the two branches of government on the same view. You had a Congress who wanted to promote it with federal funds, and Reagan and Bush didn't want it. Now you have Clinton and Gore, who do want to fund embryo destructive research with federal dollars, and they're coming into a Congress uh, 
that, uh, that uh, is, uh, agrees with them. So there's a, a kind of alignment of interest for the first time uh, since the 1970s on this particular question. So Congress, at the behest of President Clinton, lifts feder the, the, uh, the federal funding moratorium on embryo research. That is, in the NIH Revitalization Act <coughs> of 1983, they removed by statute the requirement that the EAB, the non-existent board, approve any proposals for uh, embryo destructive research uh, uh, federally funded. And then, uh, and you've seen this face today as well in, in Ben's presentation, uh, President uh, Clinton asked the director of his NIH to put together a panel, the human embryo panel, to come up with, uh, come up with uh, suggestions for a, a framework for providing funding for research involving the use and destruction of embryos. Now, it, I should mention here that we're not even talking about stem cell research in any concrete, realistic way yet. What we're talking about is research on embryos mostly connected to the development of, of tech, and improvement of techniques involving IVF, involving reproductive uh, 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 treatment and therapies. So that's the main concern there, although I should say that the embryo panel was very prescient and talked about in their report itself about the possibility someday of deriving stem cell lines from human embryos, and they, they, they offered, uh, and so, that, so it's, it's not as if they didn't have that in mind at all. Um, so, Harold Varmus puts together a group, and Ben already mentioned to you earlier today, that it was, it was an entirely ideologically homogenous group. There was not a single member of the, the human embryo panel of NIH who took the view that the, moral em that the, that the embryo enjoyed a high uh, moral status, that the human embryo was um, sort of morally inviolable and couldn't be conscripted uh, for use and destruction in, in biomedical research. Not a single member of the panel held that position, and Ron Green, a member of the panel, was asked, and this actually is an interesting um, uh, 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 resonance with Ben's earlier talk, uh, when he was asked, well, why, why don't you have more diversity? Why don't you have more diversity of the group? And he said, that would really conflict with our aspiration of having the highest level of expertise possible in this, in this group. Um, so it's important to notice, so, so now we're into President Clinton's we're, we're, we're at the very front end of President Clinton's policy with respect to uh, embryo destructive research and the federal funding of that, of that activity. Again, the story of the current state of affairs with respect to embryonic stem cell research and the law is a story of the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and the Obama administration. So now we should attend closely to the kind of methodology and, 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 uh, and principles that were at work in the, uh, in the Clinton apparatus with respect to this question. So the NIH embryo panel, in its report, made it clear that it was not going to answer, was not going to engage the contested question of the moral status of the embryo. Now you might ask yourself, how is that possible since what you're doing is you're talking about funding for research involving the use and destruction of embryos. Wouldn't you at least implicitly have to answer that question to decide what your policy should be? But and that, was, that would be my reaction. But that's not, uh, but they didn't, uh, they didn't anticipate that rejoinder in their, in, their, um, in, their, in their report. And they say, look, we're not called upon to decide which of the competing views of the moral status of the embryo is correct. Our task here is to propose guidelines for embryo research that would be acceptable public policy based on reasoning that takes account of generally held public views regarding the beginning and development of human life. The panel conducted its del deliberations here in terms that were independent of a particular religious or philosophical perspective. So here, you can see that, the, 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 as Ben mentioned in his remarks, the NIH Human Embryo Panel has a very, very thin conception of what deliberations involving public policy are. So philosophy, moral deliberation, that, that's, that, those are thick uh, kind of uh, endeavors. Over here, we're doing something different. We're doing public policy. What we're doing here is we're engaged in trying to find the reasonable accommodation of diverse interests. It is not the role of those who help form public policy to decide which of the views is correct. Now, that's an amazing statement. We are forming public policy. We are putting regulations into place that will most likely have the full effect of the law with all of the coercion that that entails. And we're not going to, it's not our job, though, to decide who's right and who's wrong on the zero-sum game question 
of whether an embryo is a living human being who's entitled to moral respect, or is an embryo simply a tissue sample that can be used and destroyed for research purposes. We're not going to answer that question. It's not our job to answer that question. We're here to do public policy. That's the position that's taken by the uh, NIH embryo panel. And so they, um, they, uh, they made their recommendations. Um, and the, uh, the recommendations were very permissive. They supported the funding of embryo research, uh, <coughs> including protocols involving the creation of embryos solely for the sake of research. And they seem to <coughs> adopt the view that the 14-day uh, sort of marker in the development of the embryo was morally significant, but they did allow for the possibility of going beyond 14 days for certain kinds of protocols, for certain kinds of uh, where it was necessary, basically. Um, President Clinton accepted all of their proposals, although, as Ben said, interestingly, <coughs> he did not accept the proposal that protocols involving the creation of embryos solely for the sake of research should receive federal funding. Now, he has since uh, expressed the view that he regrets that decision, that he thought that that was, um, that that was unduly restrictive. But, um, but, but for, for whatever that's worth. But the, the takeaway here, though, is that President Clinton said, all right, I accept virtually all of your recommendations. We're going fe to federally fund embryo research for the first time in American history. We're going to use federal tax dollars to create incentives for the use and destruction of human beings at the earliest stages of development. And so they began to make preparations to, 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 to put this program in motion. But something happened. The Republicans took over Congress in 1994. And remember the situation that we had very briefly where you had a Congress and a president who had the same views on the question of federal funding of embryonic, uh, embryo research is now we're back into a, a situation of, of stalemate. Uh, the, new, the, the new Republican Congress was not, did not share President Clinton's view that the federal government should fund this activity. And so what they did was they enacted an appropriations rider, Jay Dickey on the left, a Democrat from Arkansas, and Roger Wicker, now Senator from Mississippi, uh, passed uh, a, what's called a rider to the appropriations bill that funds a number of departments, including the Department of Health and Human Services, which includes the National Institutes of Health. Um, the rider... Uh, which was reenacted every year thereafter, which said no funds, none of the funds made available in this act may be used for the creation of embryos for research purposes, or, and this is the important part, research in which a human embryo or embryos are destroyed, discarded, or knowingly subjected to risk of injury or death, greater than allowed for research on fetuses in utero, which is a very high standard of protection for fetus, fetuses in utero, and so essentially what this, what, what this means is that, uh, and what everybody thought this meant was, there can be no federal funding of embryo destructive research. Dickey meant. Well, four years later, actually uh, three years later, uh, there it was reported that uh, human embryonic stem cells were isolated for the first time by Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin. And there was a wave of enthusiasm that moved through certain uh, sectors of the scientific community and the political class, including President Clinton. President Clinton was so enthusiastic about this new technology, he asked his general counsel of the Department of Health and Human Services, Harriet Rabb, to look closely at the Dickey Amendment and to try to see if there's any way consistent with the letter of that law to authorize funding in some way that would allow the federal government to get behind this new species of research. And so, like a good lawyer, Harriet Rabb looked very closely at the language, very precisely at the language, and came up with a very narrow construction of what the language means. And her judgment was, if you look closely at Dickey, what it says is, there can be no federal funding of research in which embryos are destroyed or subjected to certain kinds of that doesn't mean that you can't fund research on embryonic stem cell lines that are derived from a process that destroys the embryo. In other words, uh, while we're, we don't, we're obviously not allowed to pay someone with federal dollars to destroy an embryo or who is, in the process, to, who is destroying an embryo as part of their research, 
But once the embryo is destroyed, and you have the embryonic stem cell lines, can't we give federal funding for work involving those lines? And obviously create an incentive for the entirety of the process itself. I mean, it should be obvious that the, the, the intention of RAB and the Clinton administration and the federal funding in this context is to create incentives for people to engage in embryonic stem cell research. And, uh, and, and as my colleague Yuval Levin puts it, the government was making a very clear offer. If you can get your hands on embryonic stem cell lines that were derived in a way that comports with principles of informed consent, but derived in a way that was you know, that would derive from the use and destruction of embryo, we will give you federal money for that if you have a, a, a worthy research protocol application. Well, obviously the, the founder, the, the authors of the Dickey Wicker Amendment, Jay Dickey, Roger Wicker, and many other members of Congress were, were very upset with this narrow construction of their rider. They thought that they had clearly um, forbidden any involvement by the federal government that incentivized the use and destruction of embryos. But uh, Harriet Rabb, on the other hand, took a very narrow view of the language. They wrote a very angry letter to Donna Shalala, who responded and said, well, thank, we appreciate that you're upset with this. We have a different view of what the, what the language means. And so we're going to proceed accordingly. And so President Clinton began to make preparations to fund embryonic stem cell research in this fashion. That is, to authorize funding for research involving the lines that are, uh, that are derived from embryos that are necessarily destroyed. So he came up with guidelines, his NIH came up with guidelines for human embryonic stem cell research, which said, we, you know, obviously in, 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 uh, in uh, implementing these guidelines, we have to respect the Dickey Amendment as construed by RAB. <coughs> and they further added the restriction uh, in their guidelines that the only uh, source of embryonic stem cell lines that were eligible for federal funding were those from embryos that were created uh, in fertility clinics um, and donated by their, their parents when they no longer wanted them uh, for those purposes. But before any money could be allocated to any researchers, there was, you may recall, the 2000 election. Hard to, hard to think that, that 537 votes in Florida made the difference between President Bush's policy in embryonic stem cell research and what would have been President Gore's policy in embryonic stem cell research, but that, that is, it is what it is. And President Bush was called upon as one of his first actions in, in, as, as, as uh, president to grapple with the question of what would be his policy for, the federal, uh, for federal funding of embryonic stem cell research. <clears throat> and you may remember, it was, it was his first televised address. At that point, it was the only televised address an American president had ever given on a matter relating to public bioethics. And it's a kind of remarkable address, if you remember, because it really it, it, it laid out so many different competing positions on the question of what the federal government's role should be in this area. But it was really impossible to tell until the end of the speech what his final conclusion was going to be. He went through, he described, on the one hand, people argue that embryos are human beings and entitled to maximal moral respect. On the other hand, people think they're, they're, uh, they're simply um, you know, uh, uh, parts of, uh, of, of, uh, of um, <coughs> sort of uh, you know, tissue in a, in a petri dish. We think that you know, we care about alleviation of suffering on the one hand, but on the other hand, we have to uh, inculcate a culture of life. And he was sort of going back and forth in all these different perspectives. And, uh, and he framed it uh, as, uh, as a, a kind of conflict between competing normative goods of protecting life in all of its phases with the prospect of saving and improving life in all of its stages. Uh, and then he settled in conclusion that while he supports science, and he's a, an enthusiastic supporter of science, an important side constraint on the progress of science towards the alleviation of suffering is the respect for the inviolability of every human being. We can't have a science that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, doesn't take seriously our most fundamental obligations to, uh, to respect the equal dignity of all human beings. Um, and you can see here he says, I, I believe that human life is a sacred gift from our creator. I worry about a culture devalues life and believe as your president, I have an important obligation to foster and encourage respect for life in America and throughout the world. So what policy then did President Bush adopt? Well, he, that, by the way, that's Elias Zerhouni, the director of NIH for President Bush. Um, what he said was 
We should pursue science to the fullest extent possible while respecting the side constraint of the respect for the equal dignity of every human being. So what that means in practice is my government will fund all species of stem cell research that do not create material incentives to use and destroy human beings at the embryonic stage of development. So concretely, that means there's funding, uh, uh, there's under, there are no restrictions on the eligibility of funding for stem cell research that, uh, that, uh, that meets that criteria, including adult stem cell research, which doesn't involve embryos, and embryonic stem cell research on lines that were derived before the announcement of the policy. So, there were embryonic stem cell lines. Originally, he thought the number was 68, it, or uh, 64. It was, up, uh, up, it was uh, revised upward to 78. 78 lines that had been derived before August 9th, 2001, where the embryos had been destroyed. They were beyond our reach. We couldn't help them anymore. Uh, and, um, uh, and it met President Bush's criteria. It turns out, and the scientists can correct me if I'm mistaken about this, that only about, I think, 23 of those 78 lines proved to be uh, viable for purposes of, of research. But in any event, um, President Bush uh, thought that you could licitly use those lines or to fund work using those lines if you, A, declared the wrongness and the injustice of the Embryo Destructive Act uh, that, that produced those lines, and B, erected disincentives to the future uh, perpetration of that same injustice. And so his mechanism to achieve that goal was to say, I will fund research involving those lines, but if you, if you kill an embryo today or tomorrow and derive an embryonic stem cell line from it, you will not get federal funding from my government. So there's no incentive, there's no material incentive to, to derive more embryonic stem cell lines from the perspective of, of, of taxpayer dollars. Okay? So um, now this was an issue throughout the president's first administration, and it became a big issue in the 2004 election when President Reagan's son, Ron Reagan, gave a, a speech at the Democratic National Convention uh, uh, proclaiming the, the, the virtues of cloning for embryonic stem cell research. Uh, Christopher Reeve was, was invoked many times, and Presidents Kerry and uh, <laughs> uh, Senator Kerry and, and then Senator uh, John Edwards were, uh, were very open in their, um, in their, uh, 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 their passion for, for promoting embryo destructive research. In fact, John Edwards famously said, if John Kerry is elected president, people like Christopher Reeve, he didn't say in fairness to John Edwards, because I wouldn't want to call him a liar, uh, people, like people like Christopher Reeve uh, will get up and walk. Uh, it's an extraordinary claim, uh, even for uh, a politician. Um, uh, during the Democratic primary, Howard Dean, one of his arguments was, not only would he change the Bush stem cell policy, but he would fire the staff of the President's Council on Bioethics, which included me, which I thought was, had never been threatened by a political candidate before. Um, so in, uh, in, in 2006 and 2007, there were congressional efforts to overturn President Bush's policy, uh, and President Bush, in the first and second vetoes of his, of his administration, um, gave further voice to the justifications and the normative goods that underpinned his approach to this question. In his veto statement in 2006, he spoke explicitly about the moral status of the embryo. He said, uh, he said that, uh, that each of these human embryos is a unique human life with inherent dignity and matchless value. That's, a, that's, that's a, a very strong statement, even stronger than what he said in the 2001 speech. We all begin our lives as a small collection of cells. And these children, by the way, that he's holding are uh, snowflake babies, they're, they're called. These are, these are children who were adopted as cryopreserved embryos. And, uh, and President Bush, in his veto ceremony in the East Room of the White House, uh, called them all to, uh, to, celebrate, uh, to celebrate his veto of the effort to overturn his policy. And their presence was an important symbolic expression of the, the meaning of, of human embryos. And President Bush uh, uh, made the point, especially responsive to the claim that sometimes made, well, shouldn't we, shouldn't we at least use and destroy the living embryos that are left over after IVF that nobody wants, that they're gonna get rid of anyway? President Bush spoke directly to that claim and said, no, in fact, uh, as these children are a testament to, uh, 
uh, each of these children was, was, was adopted while an embryo, uh, remained as an unused embryo after fertility treatments were complete. And these boys and girls are not spare parts. Now, in his own way, President Bush is suggesting that, uh, I think, that uh, just because someone has decided, as a matter of their own will, that a person is no longer needed or wanted and should be destroyed, should be killed, that doesn't, that doesn't provide authorization for that person to then hand that uh, same individual over to scientific researchers who will kill them for their purposes uh, for, for speculative scientific research. It's, um, it's uh, I, th I think, a, a facially appealing argument about shouldn't some good come from from, from the loss that's about to happen, but if you really focus on what's happening, you don't get distracted by the abstraction of, uh, 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 of, uh, of, of, this, of this debate. You realize what you're talking about is, is a human being who is doomed not because of any inexorable reason, but because someone has decided that they don't want uh, to live anymore. And Gil Mylander has, has written uh, eloquently about in response to the argument that President Bush is likewise responding to, and who in their very persons, the snowflake babies, um, President Bush went further and said um, that not, not only are embryos bi obviously biologically human, are, aren't they biologically uh, one of us as members of the human species, but our deepest principles, our founding principles on which our entire government is constructed is that all human beings, all of us, every member of the human family uh, was created equal and is endowed with the right to life. So you have the biological insight that the embryos are one of us, and then the sort of normative proposition that if they're one of us, then we can't kill them, we can't use them for our own purposes. We have a, a kind of normative commitment to equality that means we have to, at the very least, not use and destroy them for our own purposes. Um, and President Bush, in his veto statement, spoke about the ends and limits of science and recapitulated in some ways some of the things that he said in 2001, talking about the importance of science serving humanity and not the other way around. Now, in the midst of all this deliberation, as you all know, and that's sort of the point of our, our gathering this week, that there was a lot of dis deliberation and discussion about possible alternative sources of human pluripotent cells. Um, and um, uh, Bill Hurlbut's proposal, which we've discussed, Don Lander's proposal, which we've discussed, uh, dedifferentiating cells, which we've discussed, IPS cells, I think the council was prescient in, uh, in anticipating that development. Um, and sure enough, in 2007, Shinya Yamanaka and Jamie Thompson, as we've heard from several of our presenters this week, uh, um, announced that they had um, uh, dedifferentiated skin cells into a pluripotent state using certain genetic factors. And that, that uh, led some in Congress to try to um, enact a law that would authorize funding for alternative sources of stem cell research without restricting, of course, uh, embryonic stem cell research. And this was, this was uh, sponsored by then Senator Norm Coleman, who lost to Al Franken a couple of years ago, you may recall. Uh, and it passed overwhelmingly in the House, 70 to 28, although President Obama was one of the few people that voted against this bill that would have simply authorized additional funding for alternative sources. But in the House, the bill uh, died procedurally. Well, President Bush stepped into the breach and, uh, and wrote an executive order, which essentially accomplished the same goals, pr prioritizing these alternative sources of uh, research involving these alternative sources, prioritizing research with the greatest short-term clinical benefit. And um, in the course of doing so, he said some things in his executive order that further fleshed out what I think we should be attending to, which are the, the first-order goods that are driving this policy itself. And I won't read these to you, but they're, they're more very strong statements about the injustice of the destruction of nascent human life, the dignity uh, uh, respect for human life and human dignity as, as chief animating purposes of his policy, and the statement that human embryos and fetuses as living members of the human species are not raw materials to be exploited and commodities to be brought, bought and sold. And then he concludes by talking about how the government has a duty to, to steward uh, the taxpayer funds in a responsible way, in a way that respects the conscience of individuals. And that leads him to adopt a policy that would prioritize this less controversial but equally, if not more promising, species of research. So uh, the final details of the Bush policy, we talked about the Clinton policy, we talked about the Bush policy, the final details of Bush, over the course of his time in office, President Bush spent $3.7 billion on all forms of stem cell research, 
which included adult and non-embryonic alternatives, $170 million on human embryonic stem cell research. And in, during this time, uh, state law, uh, state legislatures and, and, and governors uh, pursued their own approaches. Some states, which weren't happy with the federal approach, like California, passed their own laws that provided additional funding, while others maintained their laws uh, that were more restrictive. So, <clears throat> what about the current policy? 2008, President Obama is elected. Very uh, inaugurated on January 20th, uh, uh, 2009. Two months later, he, um, he uh, uh, reverses President Bush's, um, this says stem cell ban, but that's, that's not entirely accurate. The ban on the federal funding of certain kinds of stem cell research. But this is, this is a perfect kind of example of the sloppiness of some of the ways in which the media has talked about this issue. President Bush, in fact, was the first person ever to provide federal funding for stem cell research, including embryonic stem cell research. But, but it's true that hey, there were serious restraints on uh, funding for newly derived embryonic stem cell lines. President Obama announced the new funding policy. And, it has, and there are three sort of documents that, uh, that are useful for us to draw inferences about what ground and goods President Obama uh, looks to to animate his policy. So uh, in his room, and that, th those three sort of sources are his re the remarks that he delivered in the East Room, the executive order itself, which is the legally sort of most important document, and the NIH guidelines that fleshed out his executive order. <coughs> so the one theme that ran throughout his remarks is this imperative to alleviate suffering. And he spoke eloquently about, as a person of faith, he believes that we're called to care for each other and work to ease human suffering, and that we've been given the capacity and the will to pursue this research and the humanity and conscience to do so responsibly. So uh, and in this respect, you know, it's, it's hard to disagree with that. The question is, what side constraints are there in the pursuit of the alleviation of suffering? And he gives some further insight into that, uh, and he has a pretty uh, maximalist approach to pursuing therapy, to research that are oriented towards therapies for alleviating human suffering. He said, there's no finish line in the work of science. The race is always with us. The urgent work of giving substance to hope and answering those many bedside prayers, answering prayers of seeking a day when words like terminal and incurable are potentially retired from our vocabulary. And today, using every resource at our disposal with renewed determination to lead the world in discoveries of this new century, we rededicate ourselves to this work. Okay, so what mandate does President Obama have to author up, to, to implement a funding policy that for the first time ever uses taxpayer funding to promote use and destruction of human beings at the embryonic stage of development? <coughs> he cites in his remarks a consensus of the majority of Americans. It's a strange formulation, right? So a consensus and a majority of different, <laughs> different things. But he says the majority of Americans from a variety of backgrounds have come to a consensus that we should pursue this research and the potential it offers is great, and with proper guidelines and strict oversight, the perils, what perils? The perils can be avoided. What perils? He doesn't say. Uh, and what about side constraints? What about side constraints in the pursuit of science in this respect? Well, he, he names three. One, the, the research has to be scientifically worthy. Two, uh, it has to be responsibly conducted. And three, it has to be legally permissible. It has to be lawful, responsibly conducted, and, and scientifically worthy. Although he doesn't explain what constitutes worthiness in this respect or responsibility in terms of the execution of this research program. But then he goes on to, to assure everyone that the government will never open the door to the use of cloning for human reproduction. And he argues that it's dangerous and wrong and has no place in our society or any society. And you'll notice here he's, what he's talking about is not the cloning of embryos for biomedical research. He's talking about the cloning of a, of a, of a, of a human embryo and then the transfer of that embryo to a woman's uterus uh, with the purpose of initiating a pregnancy that culminates in the birth of a live-born child. That's what he means by cloning for hu human reproduction. Uh, and, and that is the only concrete harm that he mentions throughout uh, his remarks. Um, and he concludes his remarks by talking about science policy and what role scientists should play uh, in the formulation of science policy. And he takes a fairly deferential 
posture with respect to scientists. Promoting science isn't just about providing resources. It's about protecting a free and open inquiry. It's about letting scientists like those who are here today do their jobs free from manipulation or coercion and listening to what they tell us even when it's inconvenient, especially when it's inconvenient. But in his remarks, he doesn't mention one time the moral status of the embryo. And again, regardless of your politics, it's a striking contrast between the sort of mini lecture on bioethics that President Bush gave on August 9, 2001, and this very narrow, uh, kind of uh, uh, triumphalistic speech that President Obama gives that doesn't even mention what most people take to be the single most <clears throat> vexing question in this area, which is the moral status of the embryo and what its moral standing, how its moral standing relates to other goods that we want to pursue like science and medicine. He doesn't mention the perils. He doesn't say what constitutes the misuse and abuse that his standards will, uh, will, uh, will avoid. So, but maybe the executive order says something more about that. Maybe the executive order gives us more information about what he takes to be the harms to be avoided in this area, not simply the goods to be pursued. Well, in the policy section, where President Obama lays out his sort of normative vision, uh, uh, for, for why he's pursuing this approach. Uh, he, cites, he cites two things. He cites the sort of enthusiasm that he has for the potential for better understanding of, of diseases uh, and possibly developing therapies on the one hand, and the broad agreement in the scientific community that research should be supported by federal funds. So basically, enthusiasm for the, the hoped for promise of this research and the agreement within the scientific community that this is entitled to federal funding are the justifications for the policy itself, as articulated by the executive order. So <coughs> what are the restraints? What does responsible and scientifically worthy mean in this context? He recapitulates that formulation in, in section two. The only eligible research is responsible, scientifically worthy research that is also permitted by law. But now, I didn't mention this a moment ago, but in his remarks to Congress, in his remarks in the Eastern, President Bush, or sorry, President Obama asked Congress to offer, to take steps legislatively to offer further support for embryonic stem cell research. And most people took that to mean an invitation to overturn the Dickey Amendment. Um, so what are the limits of the new policy? What does it mean? Uh, Pres President Obama didn't say. It's a very short executive order. He simply said the NIH will take these guidelines and flesh out uh, a policy to, to, uh, to administer the evaluation and granting of funding for research proposals. So three principles. Ethically, uh, sorry, um, responsibly conducted, scientifically worthy, and permitted by law. Those are the three criteria. Let's pause a moment and think about the breathtaking scope of that mandate for funding. Now you still have the Dickey Amendment, which he's asked Congress to overturn. But you still have the Dickey Amendment, which says no direct funding of embryo destruction. That's one side constraint. But beyond that, there's no limit at all that President Obama has imposed on the source of embryonic stem cell lines that are eligible for federal funding. That is, in principle, according to the executive order, you could get federal funding for research on embryonic stem cell lines that, from embryos that you created with private funding solely for the sake of research, either by IVF or by cloning. Um, and so it was a very broad mandate indeed, and, and scientific researchers were very enthusiastic about it. Several months later, July 7, 2009, Francis Collins, director of NIH, uh, uh, rolled out the, um, with the, the guidelines themselves. And, by, and, and the guidelines sort of um, articulated what normative goods anchored the drafting of the guidelines. And the two normative goods were, again, hope for uh, the benefits that might come from this research. That is, um, the hoped for promise of, of embryonic stem cell research. So hope is the first principle. And the second principle is autonomy. That is, uh, the, the, the importance of emphasizing the, the free and voluntary informed consent of individuals who donate embryos. So the autonomy of the embryo donors and the hope for the cures that may come in the future are the, are the, are the, follow, are the principles that animate the NIH guidelines. Uh, 
Now, one thing that was striking about the NIH guidelines is, is how narrow they were, in, or at least on first glance, in contrast to the executive order. As a moment ago, I just said, the executive order doesn't discriminate among the sources of embryos that provide the embryonic stem cell lines that are eligible for federal funding. But the NIH guidelines do. <coughs> the NIH guidelines restrict eligibility to those embryonic stem cell lines derived from embryos that are donated from fertility clinics that were originally conceived for purposes of assisted reproductive technology. Right? It's the leftover embryos. It's the spare embryos. It's the, it's the snowflake babies that are the only sources that are, uh, of, of embryonic stem cell lines that are eligible for, for, for federal funding. And of course, they, um, they, uh, uh, they, they have uh, an art, a pretty well articulated uh, framework for voluntary and informed consent. Um, and by the way, this is not a small thing. The fact that, the fa that this NIH guidelines didn't authorize funding for embryonic stem cell lines derived from cloned human embryos was a source of great anger and irritation on the part of many research scientists, including Irv Weissman. Irv Weissman was, was livid in an article saying, I sat there in the East Room and I listened to what President Obama said, and he did not impose any restrictions like this at all on, on, the, on the eligible lines for federal funding. This is an outrage. Um, and uh, it creates the impression that there's something very conservative about, uh, about, about the, these NIH guidelines. But if you reflect for a moment, it becomes clear that that's mostly illusory because, point one, there, have been, there has been no derivation of embryonic stem cell lines from cloned embryos. No one's been able to do it yet. There was a false report of it in South Korea in 2004 and 2005, but that turned out to be fraudulent and, and racked with all kinds of unethical research behavior. And then secondly, um, it's very hard to get people to donate gametes for the sake of creating embryos solely for the sake of research, especially eggs. Uh, some people have tried to recruit egg donors to make their own IVF embryos for the sake of research. At Harvard, they were trying to do that, and they met with very little success. So in fact, the restriction, the apparent restriction of funding for research uh, for embryonic stem cell lines derived only from IVF embryos is not really a significant restraint because it doesn't actually limit any practices that are widespread or possible at the moment. Now, if you look at the informed consent guidelines of President Obama's policy and the NIH guidelines, there's some reason for concern in my judgment. There is uh, no requirement to inform donors specifically that the derivation of uh, stem cell lines from the embryos they're donating destroys the embryos. There's a phrase that says you have to tell them what happens in the derivation process. But that, and many commentators in the notice and comment process, raised very serious concerns that you could imagine a situation where the donors may not have a full understanding that what's happening in the process of derivation is the destruction of their, of their embryonic offspring. Also, there is no requirement to inform the donors of the options that are available outside of the facility where they're receiving fertility treatment. Most fertility clinics don't do embryo adoption. So if you find yourself at a fertility clinic and you have leftover embryos and you go through the informed consent process, the, there's no requirement by the NIH guidelines that you be told that there is such a thing as embryo adoption that exists outside of that clinic, that there's the nightlight embryo adoption, the snowflake babies. Uh, and, and that a, 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 was flagged as a significant defect by, by commentators. And then finally, there's only a very hortatory statement, non-binding requirement, um, non-binding statement about the aspiration that the physician and the researcher be different people. It's only when practicable that they, that, that, uh, that, they, that, they, that they be different people. So you could imagine a scenario in which the reproductive endocrinologist is also the individual who's conducting the research uh, the, uh, for which uh, embryos uh, are sought. So there's no, there's no bright line requirement that they, that they um, they, that they uh, be different people. There be a wall of separation between the treating physician and the researcher himself. Um, and then just is just sort of, uh, for those embryo, embryonic stem cell lines that were derived before the announcement of the policy, there's a working group uh, that's set up to, uh, to approve or disapprove of those protocols based on the spirit of the new guidelines themselves. Um, the guidelines explicitly mention the, the Dickey Amendment as being the legal restraint uh, on the funding. And then, they also, and, and then they sort of spell it out that the, only, that the, uh, the provision I was mentioning a moment ago 
that the embryonic stem cell lines that are eligible are only those that are derived from the fertility clinic uh, embryos. So the guidelines are definitely narrower than the executive order. There's no doubt that that's true. Although, again, as I said, they don't limit any currently available or widely practiced technique of derivation. And the most important thing to understand about the relative narrowness of the guidelines compared to the executive order itself is that they could be changed in very short order if, for example, someone uh, understands, uh, comes to learn how to derive embryonic stem cells from cloned human embryos, who can clone a blastocyst and then derive uh, embryonic stem cells from it. That would be a very small thing to, uh, to modify those guidelines to comport with the much broader executive order that they are implementing. So I should mention <coughs> very briefly, uh, as, I, as I alluded to at the beginning, that the third branch of government, the judicial branch of government, got involved into the embryonic stem cell uh, uh, dispute recently uh, when researchers who did not, who, who uh, engage in non-embryonic stem cell research brought suit against uh, President Obama's uh, Health and Human Services Secretary on the grounds that their construction of the Dickey Amendment is unlawful and that they are harmed uh, as a result uh, because they're competing in a, in a regulated market. And uh, you, as you probably have heard, Judge Lamberth in the D.C. District Court uh, agreed with that, with, the, with their argument, agreed with their construction of the Dickey Amendment, but then more recently, uh, the D.C. Circuit, an opinion written by uh, Douglas Ginsburg, um, uh, held that the, the, the Dickey language that was in dispute is ambiguous, and as a matter of, uh, of administrative law, jurisprudence, the, um, the um, uh, administrative agency's uh, interpretation of that, of that law is owed deference. So, what are the um, lessons of these three administrations? What inferences can we draw? What kind of, what's the, how can we fill out the picture finally in a rich way uh, with respect to the normative dimensions of, of, of those policies? Well, first of all, if you look at Clinton, it's interesting because what Clinton did was basically delegated the bulk of the question to an advisory committee. He, dele he delegated normative reflection and the duty to explain the judgment to that advisory committee. And the advisory committee, as we talked about, had adopted a very thin normative framework. Remember, we're doing public policy. We're trying to reasonably accommodate different views in light of generally held positions. Uh, and they did engage some ethical reflection on the moral status of the embryo, but again, maintain this official agnosticism, but when the rubber met the road, the policy that they advised was broadly permissive. So they said, we're not gonna take a view on this contested question about the moral status of the embryo, but then they adopted a policy which was rooted in a very distinctive moral perspective on the, on the, on the status of the embryo. President Bush, by contrast, took a presidential level uh, approach to this decision. He himself uh, worked through the decision uh, worked through the, po the, the details of the policy with his advisors, delivered a, uh, uh, delivered a, a public address on television which explained in detail the, the justifications uh, for his policy, which he then deepened and extended in later fora and his veto ceremonies and the like. Um, and President Bush's uh, normative concepts at work were very thick. I mean, maximal respect for human beings at all stages, an expansive and ro robust equality principle with a pretty well worked out framework for moral complicity. Uh, so very thick principles at work, normative principles at work, but then kind of asymmetrical because the policy that he adopted, and there are reasons for this, but the policy he adopted was, was relatively thin in terms of impact because it simply restrained federal funding. It didn't do anything uh, to, to touch the, relate, to pr the private funding of, uh, uh, in, uh, of this research or, or the fact of the research going on in other fora. And you would think that if you, if you take seriously those thick normative concepts about the inviolability of every human being, uh, that, 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 um, that, your, that, that your policy might be more uh, impactful. And there are ways to argue, I think, and I have in other, other publications, argue that President Bush in other contexts and sort of, there, there are a lot of ways to explain this, this asymmetry, both procedurally and, and substantively. But it remains a significant critique that should be taken seriously. Finally, President Obama adopted a hybrid of the Clinton and Bush models. He did take a presidential level decision on the issue. He articulated an executive order and gave a speech, but didn't really resolve most of the normative questions. He delegated the fleshing out of the policy to his NIH. So like Bush, 
He took the lead on articulating his policy, but like Clinton, delegated the formulation of that policy to a subsidiary branch of, of, the, of, of the executive branch of government. Now, President Obama, even less than President Clinton, because I think you can attribute the reasoning from the NIH embryo panel to President Clinton because he adopted it mostly, uh, President Obama has the least developed public explanation of his foundational principles and prudential judgments. He, again, he never mentions the moral status of the embryo, never elaborates on his normative concerns, never even mentions why should we limit, uh, and the NIH guidelines don't explain why they would limit the funding to, 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 to only fertility clinic embryos. That is, funding for stem cell lines derived from embryos donated from fertility clinics. That's a, that's a, a significant restriction that was controversial with some researchers, and it was never, never explained. And, um, and President Obama's normative principle, which is the imperative to alleviate suffering and pursue knowledge for the sake of itself, is very thick and robust, with very thin, if, 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 if any, uh, side constraints. Uh, and I think the, even the informed consent framework that he adopts is not strong enough to, uh, to, to, as a, to act as a counterweight for the, for the strength of the, of the arguments for pursuing the policy. Um, President Obama was clear about his principles of governance here. He was deferring to the majority's consensus and uh, deferring to, to, the, uh, to the scientific community's consensus on, on the, the validity of this, of this work. Um, and that, and he, was, he was open about that. Um, and finally, again, there's an asymmetry also uh, in reverse here between President Obama's executive order and the NIH guidelines for reasons that we've discussed. So, very briefly, I'll conclude. What about process here? What have we learned from these three administrations? Well, one thing we've learned is that structure matters. Federalism matters, separation of powers, the fact that we're government enumerated powers matters. And we see that in the fact that the shared obligations for governance in this area are split among, certainly among the political branches of government. And if those branches of government are not in alignment, then you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to be able to do anything meaningful, right? You're not going to be able to do anything um, meaningful. We saw that up until 2009, uh, when um, if you have, I mean, it, we, we, again, it's, it's sort of a thrust and parry, if you will, back and forth between the political branches. So structure matters, but then of course politics matters as well. Changes in elections have made radical differences in this, in this debate. Um, I think that we can say that it's perfectly clear that the law is a moral enterprise. Every, every instance uh, of, this, of, this, of, this, uh, of this narrative includes um, both the, uh, the reflection of the normative goods that are held by the administration and the polity that it represents, as well as shaped, I think, and constituted those judgments uh, of others. I think that people look to the president's policies and draw certain kinds of normative inferences from them and say, you know what? Um, embryonic stem cell research must be a worthy thing if President Obama is, is dedicating so many resources to it. I think that the experience of the NIH Human Embryo Panel exposes the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the falsehood that there is a view from nowhere, that you can adopt an ideologically neutral position with respect to these kinds of policies. Because recall that the NIH Embryo Panel said that we're neutral, religiously neutral, and we're ideologically neutral but then adopted a, a, an approach that was squarely at the very far end of one of the sides uh, of the debate. So it's just it's simply not possible. And this, again, um, uh, resonates, I think, with what Ben was saying uh, in his remarks. Um, I think we can say something about the value and limits of science for public bioethics in, if we think about the, the narrative of these three administrations. That is, I would argue that President Obama's deference to scientists as scientists makes little sense when we're talking about our questions of membership and moral obligation to others and, 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 and goods that we're pursuing and harms that we're trying to avoid. And I think we've learned something about the elements of legitimacy in government, the duty to explain your principles and judgment, public reason, uh, not narrowly understood but broadly understood, and the importance of, of pluralism. Finally, substantively, I think it's important again to return to the question, to return to the, 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 the idea that this whole area is fundamentally about who counts and who decides who counts. And President o Clinton and Obama gave very different answers to that question than President Bush did. Clinton and Obama said, uh, that they, said we're, they said we're not offering an, an explicit answer on that question, but then they adopted policies that were grounded in a very strong implicit answer to that question. 
if, if, if you, you can't say, I don't know what an embryo is, but I'm going to pay you to, to do work uh, that entails or depends on its prior destruction. That, that's, that's an incoherent statement. President Bush offered a clear answer. He said, I think an embryo is a human being. An embryo is one of us. But then he adopted uh, arguably asymmetrical policies and didn't, uh, you could argue, didn't pursue uh, with the full strength of his office uh, policies to protect human life in the earliest stages of, of its development. Now, there are counter arguments to that position, but I think it's a serious argument. Now, the one thing I'm going to leave you with, the one, que the one question I'm going to leave you with, it, it's something that bothers me a lot, is that this question of who counts seems like such an important and profound question, which is fraught with so many dangers, on, and so many possibilities for injustice on a massive scale. We have to ask ourselves, is are our current structures and principles up to this challenge? I mean, it's not enough to say, well, if you win a presidential election, you can get your people in there, and they can adopt a different stem cell policy. Or even further, you can amend the Constitution and say who counts and who doesn't count. Because even in that structure, in that system, there's the possibility that some subset of us will be deemed subpersonal and abused destroyed in horribly unjust ways. And the fact that that's possible in the system that we have raises a very serious concern for me. And I don't have a good answer to what to do about that. But I think it's definitely worth thinking about because not every question, and certainly not the question of who counts as a rights-bearing individual, should be subject to the political processes of, of the liberal democracy. So, Anyway, with that very provocative ending, I would uh, I thank you for your attention and would be glad to, to answer any questions that you have.